Romans 6, 15 through 23 today, titled, From Slaves of Sin to Slaves of God. Let's pray. Lord, just as we uh, look to just your call for the gospel to go to the nations, the tribes, the tongues, that they might know the saving ways of God, that they might rejoice in you and be glad, that they might then go forth and tell the nations around them of your wonders, that many would fear you and know you and give you glory and worship. Uh, Lord, it all kind of trickles back to just the wonderful truths like Romans chapter six of what you've done inside of us in the good news of the gospel and how that works uh, to the outside of us in our obedience and in our action and our good works, all because of what you've done, all because of how wonderful you are. And Lord, as we just go from a death to sin principle to a slaves to obedience principle. Lord, give us not only the capacity mentally to comprehend these things, Lord, give us just the charge in the heart to love these things, that we could live these things out for your glory, for your fame here and there and across the world. In Jesus' name, amen. On May 28th, 1972, the Duke of Windsor uh, who was the uncrowned King Edward VIII, died in Paris. Paris, the same evening, a television crew uh, rehearsed the main events of his life. Uh, there were all kinds of little clips from various TV things that he'd done interviews in in the past about his upbringing, his little short reign, his abdication, and as he was recalling his boyhood as the Prince of Wales, he said this, my father, King George V, was a strict disciplinarian. Sometimes when I'd done something wrong, he would admonish me saying, my dear boy, you must always remember who you are. My dear boy, you must always remember who you are. And it's our conviction from the scripture that our heavenly father says the same thing to us and, and brings it out through the apostle Paul that as his dear children, we must always remember who we are. As you look at where we left off last week, Romans 6 verse 14, it all closes with this tiny little phrase, you are not under the law but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What a wonderful phrase, easy to memorize, right? Well, we go into verse 15 of our text today that says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. And I don't know if you've been here the last couple of weeks, but you'll see that there's just almost a parallel to chapter six, verse one. Some great doctrine, some great theology is expressed and either the critic and the cynic or uh, the antinomian might be a new word for you this week, but it's kind of old to us over the last two weeks. That is someone who just wants to sin in pleasure, take the pleasure of sin, knowing that it's all cool, God's a gracious God. That's called an antinomian. So whether it's people that are critical of Paul's gospel of grace or the person that just wants to sin their lights out, um, they come up with these excuses as to why they might be able to continue in sin. If you were to go back to 6.1, it says... Uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? And that comes from the end of chapter five where it says where sin abounded, grace super abounded. And so the critic, the cynic, and the antinomian would say, oh, awesome. The more sin I have, the more grace God gives. So then we can just go ahead and sin like crazy and grace will come like crazy. 
right? And just Paul, over the last two weeks for us, he went into no way. It's just not even a possibility for people who know what the gospel has done for them and that they've died with Christ and now live a new life with Christ. It's just incongruous with the new life to live just practicing sin. And so the same thing happens here in verse 15, as we heard that we're not under the law, we're not under the rules of Moses, but we're under grace. And then that cynic critic, uh, cynic, critic, antinomian would say, oh, so now we can sin because we're not under the law. Yes. Like it's just that person that's just always looking for that excuse to keep living in that bondage that they're in. Yeah, and, uh, and, but we're under grace now. And then just the same answer that Paul always gives in these cases, you're probably familiar with it. It's this emphatic, certainly not, certainly not, perish the thought. Tim Keller says, we're not under the law, as we saw in verse 14. Does not mean we're free to live in any way we choose. If the law of God is no longer the way we're saved, are we therefore under no obligation to live a holy life? This is the substance of Paul's question in verse uh, 15. So uh, the, the questions of chapter 6 verse 1 and chapter 6 verse 15, they're similar questions, but they're not identical questions. Back in verse one, and you might just put your finger, I'm teaching Titus just how to grow in his reading skills. And I remember when he was little, I think it was Russell actually, when he was little, the teacher would say, use your air finger and like get your finger over what you're reading so you don't lose your spot. You can actually track it along. And I, I tell you congregation, get your air finger out, okay? Get down there back to chapter six, verse one, where the question of sinning there is in order to gain more grace. Oh, more sinning, more grace, right? You guys feeling me, right? Whereas in verse 16, air finger down to verse 15, is a question of sinning because of grace. Oh, because of grace, now we can just keep on sinning. Sandy Adams uh, from Calvary Chapel, Stone Mountain, Georgia, says, a skeptic might say God has freed you from the law for you to live lawlessly. But just the opposite is true. Under the law, it was up to us to obey, but under grace, God does the work. God ends our obligation to the law, not because it's okay to break it, but because through grace, we're more inclined to keep it. I gotta tell you guys, I read a lot. I got just my books that I read for Romans and there, there's some deep, thick, gotta read and reread paragraphs. And I go to my friend, Sandy Adams from Calvary Stone Mountain. Uh, we've done some conferences together and things and he's just, he's hilarious. He's got the great comedy. And, uh, and I'm like, Sandy, like this is some of the best stuff I've read all week. Concerning this question, I would just want to say it again. God ends our obligation to the law. It's the last sentence there. Not because it's okay for us to break it, but because through grace, we're more inclined to keep it. It's almost like, hey, I can remove the rules for you, uh, upperclassman teenager in my home. Certain rules, I can lift those because you've proved your maturity and just your ability to go ahead and exercise self-control. You're thinking, not my upperclassman teenage, you know what I mean, right? It's like, oh man, what the maturity in this person, right? And so uh, this objection raised again, uh, it was John Stott that said, we might say that Paul has returned to the beginning of the track, as if he's gone back to verse one again, and will now replay it although with two significant shifts of emphasis. Both come into the same conclusion though. Freedom to sin is fundamentally incompatible with our Christian reality. And so he says, should we, uh, let's see, how's he, how's he exactly put it there? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? And he says, certainly not, or by no means. Why is that? Keller says, because being saved doesn't mean you're free 
from having a master, you can be either a slave to sin or a servant to God. But you cannot be neither and you cannot be both. All right? I'll say that again. You can either be a slave to sin or a servant to God, but you cannot be neither and you cannot be both. And so Paul gets into explaining this. Look at verse 16. So remember, certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Probably everyone who's ever taught this has gone to the Bob Dylan song. Right, And I got to say, I only knew the chorus, so I looked up the verses of You Gotta Serve Somebody by Bob Dylan. And probably the best verse that explains it has a little bit of an inappropriate phrase in it, so I'm not going to read that verse to you guys. But I will use a different verse that he says that gets the point across. You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. Oops, I put the inappropriate part in there. Just kidding, dancing's okay. Um, <laughs> You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Can you believe Bob Dylan must have been reading Romans 6 when he wrote that song, right? Don't you know that whomever you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave who you obey. Now, maybe just underline there in that verse, do you not know? Something like the third time that Paul uses this phrase, knowing this, reckoning this, knowing this and this, he keeps saying, do you not know? Essentially, anybody that's familiar with the gospel should know this. He's kind of saying, you ought to know. You ought to know this. How could we possibly claim freedom to sin when we know what the Lord has done for us? Uh, the concept of slavery that Paul uses here was well known to Roman believers. It's estimated that 70% of the early Christian church, really 70% of just the Roman population, were of the slave class. And here Paul, whoa, hey, whoa. I thought that was the Lord, and then it I was like, that sounds like my voice. It definitely, okay. Uh, Paul emphasized in this passage that life under grace is still a life of obedience. Uh, Colin Cruz says, alluding to matters known in first century Mediterranean culture, being a slave involved both status that's somebody wholly owned by another, and control, that's someone who's subservient to another. Among Paul's audience, there could well have been those who offered themselves slaves because of economic uh, necessity. I believe that would be called like an indentured servant. There would also have been freedmen, those who once had been slaves but had grant, been granted or purchased their freedom. The former would know what it was like to be someone's slave, and the latter might have found the idea of believers being slaves uh, unpalatable. But essentially, this idea, it comes across, and everyone in that culture would have understood the picture, the metaphor that Paul was using here, and the summary of it all essentially is, you belong to the power that you choose to obey. Now, conversion for a Christian, it actually is an act of self-surrender. And self-surrender leads to slavery. And slavery demands total, absolute, exclusive obedience. Uh, the, uh, the verse continues to say, you can be a slave of sin leading to death. So that's where that master takes you. Sin, that master, whatever is controlling you and over you that is sinful, 
It has an end in death. We'll see that a couple times by the end of our passage today. Uh, to be a slave of sin is a slavery truly indeed as it leads to death. Or you could be a slave to something else we see in this verse of obedience that leads to righteousness. So being a slave to sin leads to death. Being a slave of obedience leads to to rightness or righteousness. And Paul's main concern here is actually ethical righteousness in the here and now in our life. As you're obedient, it leads to more and more obedience in our life. It's like obedience begets obedience, right? F.F. Bruce wrote, if a man is not being sanctified, that is being made holy, he has no reason to suppose that he is justified. If you don't see sanctification happening in your life and just that process of you being made more and more like Jesus, then there's not a lot of reason for you to really believe that you have had conversion happen in your life. It's okay to examine yourself, the New Testament says. Examine yourself daily and see if you're of the faith. If there's a lifestyle of practicing disobedience, that may just be a good clue to you that, man, I need to come before the Lord in humility, submit myself to him and become his slave, a slave that is obedient. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> Tony Meridia wrote the, uh, let's see, oh, it's actually right here. So he wrote the Exalting Jesus in Romans commentary where he said just very simply, grace gives us new want-tos. It changes our desires. Anybody get saved and you just noticed, maybe not overnight, but, but at least over some time, new want-tos started to happen. Like I no longer want to do that I want to do righteousness. I don't want to go to that sinful place, listen to that sinful thing, watch that sin. I want, I want to do righteousness now. Jesus said it well in Matthew 6, 24. Maybe I should say Jesus said it best. That no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Bob Dylan, right? You've got to serve somebody. Jesus, you can't serve both. <laughs> it's got to be one or the other. John 8, 34 through 36, Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Maybe just in your notes or in the margin of your Bible or just even in the quiet of your heart while you're listening. Lord, is there a sin that I've been just letting myself serve and it has been a master over me. It's been my master. I've been a slave to sin. 35 says there, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So maybe just in those quiet times during the rest of this sermon, you might say, I don't want to be a slave, Lord. I want to be a son I want to be a son who dwells in the house. Free me from the bondage and the slavery to sin. Help me to know that I am freed of that and help me to walk as a son now. Paul's saying that the idea that a believer can continue in sin because they're not under the law, the Mosaic law anymore, is tantamount to offering yourself as being a slave to sin. The outcome of that is death. But Jesus tells us, I've got something better for you than slave. It's son. If you're going to be a slave of me, it's like coming in and being a son. 2 Peter 2.19 uh, just talks about just the depraved. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he's brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But as it happened to them, according to the true proverb, 
A dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. And so, uh, entangled and overcome again by your previous sin is nothing more than like when a dog goes, and we've all seen it, we all have those dogs, don't we? You're like, what are you doing? Lapping that up, it's disgusting. You got it out, why do you want it back in, you know? Better out than in, right, you know? Uh, and, um, and that's just a picture of, of us going back to our sin. And then there's this very severe passage there in Peter, like, man, it would have just been better if they never would have kind of come to know the truth. And I just think of what Hebrews says concerning a passage like this, but I have better thoughts towards you. And that because you have tasted of grace, you're not gonna stay in that place where a, like you're the sow wallowing in, the mud anymore, the dog licking up the vomit, that the Lord is going to do a work in you where these things will not be tasteful to you and you'll go the other direction. Tim Keller said, put another way, a Christian does not have to obey the 10 commandments in order to be saved, but a Christian does have to obey the 10 commandments in order to be free and thus godly human being. If you don't obey the law of God, you become a slave to selfishness and sin. Now moving on in our text. Verse 17. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. So God be thanked. That just shows us that it's due to God's grace that you obeyed from the heart. You have an interesting paradigm here, or paradox here, where you have what I see is kind of the, the mystery of salvation where God sovereignly is at work in salvation. He's the one that gets to the glory. God be thanked that you did something. So you see that man's responsibility aspect of the doctrine of salvation. God, election, sovereign, calling, working, moving, predestining, initiating, all of those things, saving... And then what did, what did you do? I just obeyed from the heart. Or as when the disciples would go out and preach, they preached, repent and obey the gospel. Obey, believe the gospel, obey the gospel. So God be thanked, it's due to God's grace that you obeyed from the heart, or you might just put in your notes, wholeheartedly. It shows us that this truth convicts the heart uh, before the gospel hits the heart, it's possible to have just only a mental assent to some things and maybe you're working some things out and you're trying to muster up strength and white knuckle it and pull yourself up to, by your own bootstraps to do things, but you just find, man, there's no power in that and it's just superficial and artificial, but grasping the gospel of grace and letting the Lord plant it wholeheartedly into us. Tim Keller said, that changes our bottom line and shows you that now you're offering yourself as a slave to righteousness. And I like what Sandy Adams from Georgia said again, some of us should take the energy we once spent raising hell and use it to populate heaven. It's funny, I actually remember the second part of this quote. I didn't remember that first part. <laughs> raise hell, right? And make sons of heaven instead, right? And then he goes on to say, if you partied hardy then, I hope you'll worship hardy now. Anybody, you partied hardy back in the day? And the Lord's like, hey, take the same energy that you used to just look forward to the weekend. Everybody's working for the week. And like, especially Sunday, you know, <laughs> like we're gonna go worship the Lord, right? Uh, worship heartily, you obeyed from the heart wholeheartedly that form of doctrine to, work, to which you were delivered. Now, this is very important. That form of doctrine shows us that conversion begins with a body of truth. Truth is important. That's why we're going to Nepal and we're going to help them know doctrine. We want them to know that form of doctrine that they can live it wholeheartedly uh, a specific message with a specific content that must be received. This always means the gospel. 
And this phrase, form of doctrine, that word form is typos, not typo. That means something different to us, right? Typos, it, it, it speaks of a pattern, a pattern that molds us into something. Or another word that the Greek lexicon uses is imprint. So as we are given doctrine, today you are giving doctrine, it's like that jello mold that's given that you can form yourself into. In fact, the J.B. Phillips translation of Romans 12, 1 says, and do not let the world squeeze you into its mold, but rather you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be squeezed into the mold of doctrine. And uh, Cruz says, this suggests there's a strong link between teaching and the imprint left in such teaching on the inner person. And so as teaching and doctrine and the word goes out, there's imprint that happens. There's a stamp that happens on your heart, on your character, on your inner person. Just like Jesus said in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. When I, I think I mentioned this when we were going through John, but when Lindsay and I started dating, she quoted that and I told her, and I was a pastor at the time, I said, that's not in the Bible. I said, that's something that you probably got from watching Touched by an Angel, you know? <laughs> show that was on CBS, Roma Downey, driving around in the red Cadillac, you know, like, I mean, it's just a nice saying, but it's just not an actually like Bible verse. And she's like, you're a smart guy. So now whenever we get to that, you know, she uh, kindly reminds me it actually is in the Holy Writ. Um, but we know the truth. The truth makes us free, right? The imprint happens on our inner person, Douglas Moo believes that becoming a Christian means being placed under the authority of Christian teaching. That's God's will for New Testament believer. Being a Christian involves being under the authority of Christian teaching. Let's look at verse 18 of our text. Just going through verse 23. I think we'll get there pretty fast. It's 10 o'clock, so I gotta wrap this bad boy up. And having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. So freedom from one, now you become bound to another. Like 1 Corinthians 7, 22, if you're called in the Lord while you're a slave, you're the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free becomes Christ's slave. And so like we become servants of the Lord as we come uh, to Christ. Uh, or 1 Peter 2, 16 as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Paul would call himself a bond servant of God, and that's from that doulos picture in Deuteronomy, where if a servant loved his master, loved working for his master, he was a kind master, when the year came for him to be freed, and he decided, you know what, I want to stick around and be with this guy, because I love this guy, and he loves me, he would go to the doorpost of the house, and just in case if you're wondering if there's a biblical precedent for earrings on men, It's right there in Deuteronomy, right? But it has to be a cool peg looking thing. I'm just kidding. But they would go to the doorpost and drive an awl through that individual's ear. And that would be like a wedding ring or a symbol that I have bound myself willingly to my master because I love him. And, uh, And that's what Paul would describe himself or Peter would say, now we are bond servants of God. Look in verse 19. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of unrighteousness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So it starts out with this little phrase, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. A couple different translations of this is one says, because of your natural limitations, essentially I'm speaking to you with metaphors to help you understand, or I'm using a human analogy. Okay? I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations um, so that you grasp truth more readily. In a sense, he's using layman's terms, the picture of slavery, so that we can all understand this. We need help 
to grasp the wonder and the implications of unions with Christ. And so then after just saying, the whole reason I'm using this picture is just to help you really grasp and understand what Jesus has done for you and now what you do in response as presenting yourselves as slaves to him. Uh, we just really need to be able to grasp this. So this slavery has been a picture for you. And so following up from what last sermon, uh, last week kind of mentioned, we presented our members as slaves of uncleanness once before. All of our body parts, they were given up, yielded over as slaves to wickedness and impurity and debauchery and all of that. Now we yield ourselves over. Oh, by the way, it says in that phrase, that would always just lead to more lawlessness and more impurity. Impurity, you guys, begets more impurity. Once you stumble, once you fall, once you willingly incline yourself to that, it's going to be easier and slipper, more uh, slippery slopish to begin falling down that path again in the future. So now, instead of presenting body parts towards that, where it just falls down and slides down into more and more debauchery, instead, now we present our body parts as slaves of righteousness and of good. Uh, as we act according to truth, as we act according to righteousness, our character begins to be shaped. Our habits become habits of holiness and habits of righteousness. Um, this holiness is a state that we're aiming towards that one day will just be completely sanctified. We are seen before the Lord is holy, but we're going through a process called sanctification where he's conforming us day by day by day more and more into the image of Christ. And as we wrap up here, verses 20 through 23, we remember the superior benefits of serving God. Look at verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So remember, there's a paradox happening here. Slavery is freedom, and freedom is is slavery. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. And this is a very horrid concept. When you were a slave to sin, you didn't have to work righteousness. You were free to sin as a slave. Who in the world would want that? You know, the wicked love freedom from righteousness. Leon Morris says, this did not mean that they'd never done anything that was right. Evil, evil people do good things but it meant that they were not subject to the rule of righteousness. They saw no compulsion to do what was right, and their freedom was a grim one. And so they were free in regard or from the controls of righteousness. And verse 21 says, What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So you remember those days, right? Remember when you were a sinner, you were walking in sin, you were not obedient to Christ, and you could just live however you wanted and sin willy-nilly. You were free from doing good for the Lord. Oh, isn't that great? Wasn't that a wonderful period of life? And Paul just says, yeah, take your scrapbook out from that period of your life and show it to grandma. You know, like, do you have anything of good report to show people of, ah, those were great days. No, those were shameful days. Those were wicked days. There's nothing good that came from those days, and it all led to death. The end of those things were death. That was the volume one of your life, and you blush to remember it. It was profitless. It was shameful. It was deathly. Verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. And I just wrote, man, being a slave to God sure sounds good. Oh, remember when you were a slave to sin, you were free from righteousness. Right? Right? But now, being a slave to God, you have fruit that just blossoms off of your life, fruit to holiness, to purity, and the end fruit of that is free everlasting life, forever life. I think my kids have been saying it as they're memorizing John 3, 16, forever lasting life, <laughs> right? And uh, now each freedom is a kind of slavery. One of those is degrading, but the other is ennobling. Um, one is a license and the other is a liberty. 
And we'll have the worship team come up as we finish with this last verse. And actually, I'll quote Philip's translation there from verse 22. But now that you are employed by God, you owe no duty to sin, and you reap the fruit of being made righteous, while at the end of the road, there's life forevermore. Great memory verses, we come up to verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So you have a stipend or a wage of being a servant to sin. And what is the wage? What does it say on your paycheck when it comes with the pay stub at the end of the month? You know, it says die, right? It says death. And you're like, that's not what I was hoping for. You know, it's not going to help me buy that dirt bike. No, it's not. You know, uh, all right. But the gift, so sin gets a stipend of death, but being a slave to obedience, there's no wage, nothing that you earn, but you're given a gift, a gift of everlasting life. Witherington said, eternal life is a grace gift. Even if Christian persons manage to live an entirely sanctified life, this would not oblige God to reward them with eternal life. For they've done no more than what was required of them. Thus Paul does not see eternal life as some sort of quid pro quo for holy living in this lifetime. Salvation is indeed a matter of grace received through faith from start to finish. And so we're now offering ourselves as slaves to the Lord for righteousness. And he graciously gives us as his servants eternal life and everlasting life. And the Phillips translation of this ends it out by saying, sin pays its servants the wages death, but God gives to those who serve him. His free gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Will you guys stand with me as we close? The last couple of weeks, we have just, we have had kind of our bent towards sin and our wicked nature silenced. Our wicked nature's mouths stopped as that nature wants to keep sinning and just look for little loopholes and ways that we can just keep living in uh, just depravity and then at the same time maybe have another foot over in uh, just religion or Christianity and, and even just be like oh goodness oh I'm so glad grace lets me live this way God's a gracious God so he'll just kind of wink at my sin and let me on in and just for this whole chapter we have had Paul just answer that with just If you think that way, you don't know how awesome the gospel is. If you think that way, you don't know that you died with Jesus the day that you um, responded to the gospel and believed the gospel, but that you also live a new life with Jesus. That was the last two weeks that we studied in depth. You don't know. You're not living in the knowledge that that old person is dead. You have a new life to live uh, in righteousness for God. And then today, again, like our sinful nature just pipes up and mouths like, yay, we're not under the Mosaic law, so I can covet my neighbor's stuff and you know, maybe steal his uh, tools and covet his wife and um, just disregard the Lord's day and uh, go ahead and... Um, man, just uh, bear false witness and lie about things and embellish them because I'm not under, the law doesn't really matter and I'm under grace anyways. And, and again, Paul just says, oh goodness, if you're saying that, you still don't know that when you were converted and had an internal conversion that day you got saved, you went from being a slave to sin, now you're a slave to obedience. And you need to know who you are as a slave to obedience. You need to remind yourself daily that you're a slave to obedience. But that's not some begrudging thing. That's something that has fruit 
to everlasting life. And just today, maybe even for the first time today, you would put your trust in Jesus and just change allegiances today from being a servant to sin to surrendering to Jesus and becoming a servant of his. Right here, right now, surrender to the king. And as you're his servant, he'll give you everlasting life as a wonderful gift. Just do that right now. And let's do it afresh today as we close in this song. And maybe Johnny, just a verse and a chorus uh, as today went a little long, that'd be awesome. That last little phrase, the gift of God is eternal life. All of his goodness, all of his gifts, like a well running over upon us. I just pray that every one of you who came today would know that good gift of the grace of God upon you. Slaves to righteousness, remind yourself of that moment by moment as you go throughout the week. God bless you guys. Stick around for a little fellowship in the fireside room. Get to know each other. And if today was the first day you said, you know what? No more slavery to wickedness. I want to be a slave of Jesus. Will you come talk to me? I want to help point you on that path to living for him.